Content warning. This episode of the Did Nothing Wrong podcast contains profanity, sexist, racist, and homophobic slurs directed at the family of a congressperson by supporters of Jim Jordan's candidacy for U.S. House Speaker. Nobody under the age of 18 should listen to this episode without parental supervision. Thank you. Welcome to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast, where we cut through the noise and help you make sense of the chaotic information space around us. I'm Griff Somke. In this episode, I try to get to the bottom of why more GOP and conservative people aren't speaking out about the very real danger of what a second Donald Trump presidency would do to this country. Stick around. This is a crusade! This is a holy war against the deep state! Where are the dictators? Where are the strong men? Donald Trump is our instrument for retribution! I'm going to fight for Christians. I'm going to fight for white people. They have the Great Reset. We have the Great Awakening. And why shouldn't I root for Russia? Because I am. I want to see these people go through misery because of their grooming against our children. After the assailant entered the home asking, where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? Those are the very same words used by the mob when they stormed the United States Capitol. I did nothing wrong. One of the biggest questions I've been hearing lately is why more people on the conservative side of things don't speak out more forcefully about Trump and the unique danger that he represents. Like, why are they willing to say things off the record or to a guy like Bob Woodward, but they won't call a press conference and talk about this? And I suspect the answer is a little different for everybody. For some people, it's about safety. Because there are some incredibly unhinged people out there who will go after you if you're a GOP elected official and you say anything bad about Trump. This is from Business Insider. Senator Mitt Romney, a longtime Trump critic and the sole Senate Republican to vote to convict Trump in both of his Senate impeachment trials, spent over $46,000 on security protection at home in Utah per punch bowl. Another Republican who voted to convict Trump during his second impeachment trial, Senator Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania, spent nearly $70,000 to fortify his home, the most of any lawmaker in Punchbowl's analysis. Toomey is retiring and not running for re-election in 2022. And according to at least one report, Romney is still spending around $5,000 a day on security. A day. This is from NY1. On January 2nd, 2021, Romney was warned by Senator Angus King, independent from Maine, that a high-ranking Pentagon official had said that the certification on the Electoral College vote set for January 6th was being viewed as a moment of reckoning by Trump's extremist supporters. King told his colleague law enforcement was tracking online discussion of gun smuggling, bombs, arson, and punishing the then-president's perceived enemies in Congress, much of which eventually occurred or was attempted during the attack. As a critic of Trump's, King was concerned for Romney's safety. More than two years later, the Republican 2012 presidential nominee is still paying $5,000 a day for private security to protect his family from the supporters of his party's presidential nominee in the next two cycles, according to the book excerpt. Boy, good thing these guys are loaded, right? (laughs) Romney was worth almost $200 million in 2018, according to Open Secrets. He made his money in private equity, which, for those of you who aren't familiar with the concept, is when a business gets bought out and stripped for parts like a stolen car. And Pat Toomey just got a seat on the board at Apollo Global Management, which is another private equity giant that benefited greatly from his service in the Senate, so it looks like they gave him an extremely well-paying, cushy job as a thank you on his way out. So neither of these people depend on anyone in Trump's orbit to make a living. They can afford to harden their security, make sure their families are safe, or as safe as one can be these days. So what do you do if you're not independently wealthy like Romney and Toomey? There's a quote about that that's somewhat telling. It's from McKay Coppins' biography of Mitt Romney that was excerpted in The Atlantic. Some of the reluctance to hold Trump accountable was a function of the same old perverse political incentives. Elected Republicans feared a political backlash from their base. But after January 6th, a new, more existential breed of cowardice had emerged. 
One Republican confided to Romney that he wanted to vote for Trump's second impeachment, but chose not to out of fear for his family's safety. The congressman reasoned that Trump would be impeached by House Democrats with or without him. Why put his wife and children at risk if it wouldn't change the outcome? Later, during the Senate trial, Romney heard the same calculation while talking with a small group of Republican colleagues. When one senator, a member of leadership, said he was leaning towards voting to convict, the others urged him to reconsider. You can't do that, Romney recalled someone saying. Think of your personal safety, said another. Think of your children. The senator eventually decided that they were right. And that sounds alarmist on the surface. But it's true. We've seen it many times now. There are people out there who are ready to do extremely bad things to anyone who they perceive as an enemy of Trump. Trump himself has been stoking this fire more and more lately with his repeated threats to use the U.S. military to deal with, quote, the enemy within, unquote. Joe Biden said he doesn't think it's going to be a peaceful election day. Well, he doesn't have any idea what's happening in North Carolina. He spends most of his day sleeping. Uh, I think the bigger problem is the enemy from within, not even the people that have come in and destroying our country. By the way, totally destroying our country. The towns, the villages, they're being inundated. But I don't think they're the problem in terms of election day. I think the bigger problem are the people from within. We have some very bad people. We have some sick people, radical left lunatics. And I think they're the big, and, and it should be very easily handled by, if necessary, by National Guard, or if really necessary, by the military, uh, they, because they can't let that happen. The border is the greatest problem, I think, that this country has, other than the enemy from within. You know, the enemy on the outside is Russia, China. No, we can handle them if you have a smart president. But we have an enemy from within. We have some very sick people. And I always said, our country will never be a socialist country. And I was right. Unfortunately, they went directly to communism, okay? They skipped socialism along the way. How are you going to guard against uh, the bureaucrats undermining you? Well, they're going to undermine. Term. Well, I always say, so we have two enemies. We have the outside enemy, and then we have the enemy from within. And the enemy from within, in my opinion, is more dangerous than China, Russia, and all these countries. Because if you have a smart president, he can handle them pretty easily. I handled, I got along great with all, I handled them. But the thing that's tougher to handle are these lunatics that we have inside, like Adam Schiff, Adam Shifty Schiff. Think of this guy, he's gonna be a senator. He's running against a guy that doesn't understand politics at all, Garvey, but he was a good baseball player but he doesn't understand politics at all. Adam Shifty Schiff, who's a total sleazebag, is gonna become a senator. But I call him the enemy from within. When you look at the danger he put our country in, potentially with Russia, with a phony made up deal that he made up with Hillary and some bad people, uh, and it is the enemy from within, and they're very dangerous. They're Marxists and communists and fascists, and they're sick. I use a guy like Adam Schiff because they made up the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. It took two years to solve the problem. Absolutely nothing was done wrong, et cetera, et cetera. They're dangerous for our country. We have China, we have Russia, we have all these countries. If you have a smart president, they can all be handled. The more difficult are, the, you know, the Pelosi's, uh, these people, they're so sick and they're so evil. If they would spend their time trying to make America great again, we would have, it would be so easy to make this country great. But when I heard about that, they, they were saying I was like threatening. I'm not threatening anybody. They're the ones doing the threatening. They do phony investigations. I've been investigated more than Alphonse Capone. He was the greatest oh gangster. No, it's right. true. We've no, but think question. of it. It's called weaponization of government. It's a terrible thing. All right. They're uh, the threat to democracy. I think we have more of an enemy from within than we do from outside. You know, if you have a smart president, they talk about China and Russia and everything else. If you have a smart president, they're not going to be the problem. We have a bigger problem from within, and they hate it. I noticed uh, today... They were saying, he said the enemy from within. Of course, it's Adam Schiff. These are bad people. The most recent case of someone hearing this dangerous rhetoric and acting on it is a man named Jeffrey Michael Kelly from Tempe, Arizona, who is suspected of shooting at a Democratic Party field office in Tempe three separate times. This report is from KVUE. 
In other news, law enforcement is on alert ahead of the election. In Arizona, authorities have arrested a man for several shootings targeting a political office in Arizona. ABC's Andrew Dimbert has the details. This morning, police outside Phoenix say a man arrested in connection with three shootings at the Democratic National Committee office in Tempe had more than 200 guns and 250,000 rounds of ammo. They say Jeffrey Michael Kelly may have been planning a mass casualty attack. Justice does not have a political party. The Tempe Police Department will uphold the law and protect everyone. Police say scopes, body armor, and silencers were also found, along with a machine gun in his car. The 60-year-old retired engineer is also accused of hanging political signs lined with razor blades. Our investigators also observed Kelly posting anti-democratic signs in the area near his home in Ahwatukee, attaching clear plastic baggies containing a white powdery substance labeled biohazard. The guy had over 200 guns and over 250,000 rounds of ammunition. Just sit with that for a second. And according to AZ Central, when they pulled him over, they found numerous guns, including a machine gun, and he didn't have a cell phone with him, which raises the very disturbing question of what he was on his way to do. These people are everywhere now, but don't worry. J.D. Vance says it's not as bad as you think it is. We're talking orders. about Donald Trump and what he says. Yes. And Donald much, Trump says. And you'd much rather that, talk about what Donald Trump allegedly said I'm talking about than what, what Donald Trump did in office. I'm talking about what, what he, he said did publicly. in office, Jake. What he said publicly. 1.5% inflation. He wants to the military to go after the enemy within, which is the American people. He did not say that, Jake. The enemy he within. said that he was going to send the military after the American people. Show me the quote where he, he said, said he was going to. He said the, Ameri the enemy within. He said far left lunatics. He's talking like about the people Pelosi's rioting and Schiff. He's talking about people rioting after the election. I think the Pelosi's we were say, rioting after the election. He said you're. Chef was you're using two after the separate, election? You're using two separate phrases. He said about using the military that far left lunatics, people who riot in the wake of an election, people who burn down American cities in the summer of 2020, yes, we should have a federal law enforcement This is response. what he said to Joe Rogan on Friday. The enemy within that he wants the military to go after. No, he, no this the is the enemy thing. within you, a bigger impute, problem than Kim Jong-un. You the second part. We have, to, we have people that are really bad people that I really think want to make this country unsuccessful. That's the enemy and, within. And did he say that he wants to use the military against those people? Here, he here's he wants the to game. Use the military to go after the enemy within. Here's the game that you're playing. He said I'm that not he, playing a no, game. No, no, no. Let me. Can I answer the question, please? He said that he wanted to use the military to go after far left lunatics who are rioting, and he also called he them. Say. He also called them the enemy within. He separately, in a totally different context, in a totally different conversation, said that Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff were threats to this country. Were the enemy he within. Never were the said. enemy within. He said they were the enemy so within. So every time he uses the exact same phrase, we assume that he used I don't know. I don't throw around the term of enemy within to talk about using the well, military journal, against throwing American people. And you're asking his vice president, but you won't let me answer the question. I'm telling you that Donald Trump has said, and I agree with him, that we should use the U.S. military to, to go, go after, after people who riot who burned down our cities. And this was we what John Kelly was, the National this, Guard. This was what John Kelly was alarmed by, the idea of using the US military to go after Americans. He's That's not, what he said. Donald Trump never said Americans writ large. You keep on putting words in his mouth and are they mouth. are they not Americans? Far left people who commit acts of violence, who riot and now you're doing care. a very narrow definition of what he said, which is I not what he care. said. That's not what he said. But he let me did. ask you let no, me ask no, you the he bigger did point. Say that, Jake. He did. He said that he wanted to use the US military. Let me clarify. To go after far left lunatics, to, yes. To, and to then he go also after added people rioting and looting. And he never said he added shift. Said, and then he added the Pelosi. He never. He and then said he added people that don't want that the country Adam to succeed. Schiff, he said that Adam Schiff and Nancy Pelosi. He used in a separate context in a separate conversation. And what you're doing is you're smashing Fox, two Fox totally different about conversations. This. Fox asked him about this last week, and he didn't take issue with it. And it even extends to Trump's allies or the things that he wants to happen. Remember back in 2023 when they were having that absolute shit show of a selection process for House Speaker. Trump, you may recall, wanted Jim Jordan for the job. He made that known. So what happened next? Well, the people who didn't vote for Jordan got death threats for their trouble. 
This is from NBC. Representative Marionette Miller Meeks, a Republican from Iowa, revealed the death threats in a statement just hours after Jordan failed to secure enough votes in the second round of balloting for House Speaker. Since my vote, I have received credible death threats and a barrage of threatening calls. The proper authorities have been notified, and my office is cooperating fully, Miller Meeks said in a statement that was also posted on X. We covered this back in episode 106, and it got absolutely vile. Here's an example of what you'll get when you cross them. It's becoming really clear, like we've been saying, and like a few other people have been saying, that there isn't one Republican Party anymore. There's two factions here. Let's just call them MAGA and GOP. And they're not in agreement on this. They have a section of the GOP that will not vote for a MAGA candidate, as we saw with Jim Jordan. The first vote, he had 20 defections. The second vote, there were 22. In between, Jordan's people apparently reached out to some of the no voters and their spouses and told them that they should vote for Jordan or else they'd never account to anything in the Republican Party. Keep in mind, these are going to Congress people and their families. Why is your husband such a pig? Why would he get on TV and make an asshole of himself? Because he's a deep state prick? Because he doesn't represent the people? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to come follow you all over the place. We're going to be up your ass nonstop. We are now Antifa. We're going to do what the left does because your are of a husband gets on TV. Oh, the bad guys. They did so. I'm going to vote for Kevin McCarthy, a piece of shit who everybody knows. And for his piece of shit ass, talk about Americans who are actually fighting for Americans as the bad people. Does everything about him. So, f you, f your husband, and we are gonna. We we're not like the left. We aren't violent, but we're gonna follow your ass every appointment you have, everything you can do. Your, your husband's an asshole. You should f***ing talk to his stupid ass. We're at war. Israelis being killed. And your dumb husband is acting like a f***ing two-year-old. No wonder. He's a f***ing warmongering piece of shit. So listen, you're going to keep getting calls and emails. I'm putting all your information over the Internet now. Everybody else is. And you will not be left alone because your f***ing, f***ing husband, Jim Jordan or more conservative, or you're going to be molested like you can't ever imagine. And again, nonviolently, you won't go to the beauty parlor. Now, you must be a bitch to marry a ugly mother like that. There was some harassment, some definite threats, and you see how well that apparently worked. Well, that's their go-to. Uh-huh. Doxing, threats. They've got a problem right now. So it's clear that if you go up against this guy and his agenda in public... You will be targeted, literally, in some cases. You're going to have to watch your back. And not everyone is up for that. This country has gone from my esteemed colleague to vote for my preferred candidate or my people will threaten your life in a very short period of time. Which is a lot to process when you stop and think about it. Most of the people who are reluctant to speak out in public come from another time and place in American history where this kind of thing didn't happen. And now they're like frogs who realize the water is really hot all of a sudden. But that's not the only reason that keeps people from speaking out. I want to circle back to the part about how Mitt Romney and Pat Toomey made their money. These guys are independently wealthy. They aren't dependent on staying in the good graces of Donald Trump and MAGA. And that makes them a minority, because Trump has his stubby little fingers in a lot of pies these days, and if it reminds you of how a mob boss operates, you're probably on the right track. So many of the new generation of lawmakers and political operators are on the payroll of people like Turning Point USA, War Room. They make a significant chunk of their income from their appearances at stuff like CPAC. They write books, which are then bought in bulk by the same people, as well as the many churches that make up a huge part of this infrastructure. Their campaigns are underwritten by the same billionaires that are funding the Charlie Kirks, the J.D. Vances, the Steve Bannons. 
And they know that if they play their cards right, they can come out of this with the possibility of a media gig or at least a nice, cushy, no-show job at one of Peter Thiel's companies. But if you don't play along, you will be exiled from that world faster than you can say Madison Cawthorn. And everybody remembers what happened to him. So for some people, it's fear. For others, it's careerism. It's going along to get along. Not making waves or rocking the boat. But as we can see from the pattern of, air quotes, leaks, most of them know how bad this really is and have decided for their own reasons that it's not worth the risk of stepping up and possibly having that target placed on your back. Maybe Trump will come up with one of his nicknames for you, like Shifty Shift. And who wants that, right? <laughs> Especially when it's accompanied by an email inbox full of threats to you and your family. But I think that's why this is important. Because we aren't getting past this with the people who might be able to sway people with their voices not wanting to step up and use them. I mean, it's scary. I get it. I've been threatened. I've personally been put on at least one enemy's list that I know of. I've had weird shit happen that I can't explain. And I'm nobody. When we had Rick Wilson on the podcast, he talked about how he found out from Mark Meadows' text messages when that came up in court that they were going to audit him because he was a prominent critic of Trump and MAGA. These people will and have used and used the power of the state to come after their enemies and anyone they perceive as the enemy within. And they're not being subtle about it. I mean, just this week, the Washington Post, which has been the symbol in a lot of ways of holding politicians to account, decided not to endorse a candidate in 2024. The paper that broke the Watergate scandal, which ultimately brought down Richard Nixon's presidency, decided to tuck and run this year in a move that the outgoing editor-at-large, Robert Kagan, called a preemptive capitulation to Donald Trump. We can have a discussion about what, you know, whether newspapers should sure. endorse or not endorse is an interesting conversation. But I think what the really important thing to see here is this is how American institutions fail to protect us. Uh, the Washington Post is one of those institutions. Uh, it, it represents the free press in this in this country. And we are seeing now, I think, a preview of coming attractions of what things are going to be like in a Donald Trump presidency, uh, the bullying of the media and the acquiescence uh, of the media to uh, to Donald Trump's wishes. Uh, this was a preemptive uh, capitulation on the part uh, of Jeff Bezos for a purely business reasons. I think it's very clear what his motives were. You know, it, 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 what part that's interesting to me is that as journalists, we are subject to threats and accusations and people, you know, don't like us, whatever the case is, but we sign up for it. We decide we're in this fight. The message this sends to readers and to, to people out there is that when the institution, when the fourth estate starts to crumble, we've already seen uh, elements of government crumble. We've already seen parts of the court succumb to Donald Trump and his, his, his bullying tactics. It, they kind of need to believe that the press is is fine with being called the enemy of the people and is fine with the criticism and doesn't need to cut deals with with somebody who might be the president of the United States. Right. And, and clearly we're seeing how that need not be true. I mean, when we have, uh, you know, uh, fabulously powerful corporate uh, entities in charge of news organizations, uh, we can anticipate and we're seeing it right here uh, that those corporate entities will will choose their their profits and their and their you know effort to keep their businesses from being attacked by someone like Donald Trump, they will place that over the priority of fulfilling the mission that, a, that, a, that an institution like the Washington Post has in this country. And Marty Baron, the legendary former Washington Post executive editor, whose newsrooms have won a total of 18 Pulitzer Prizes, including 11 at the Post, had the following to say. My concern here is that are the circumstances of this uh, decision to not publish an endorsement. Every newspaper can decide whether it wants to issue political endorsements or not. If this decision had been made three years ago, two years ago, a year ago, uh, fine. They can decide whether they want to issue endorsements for president or any other political office. But this was a decision that was announced 11 days before the election. It was not a decision made in consultation with the editorial board. 
Uh, it was a decision that, according to the Post itself, its own reporting, that was made by Jeff Bezos. And um, and the circumstances are just highly suspect. Uh, so uh, that's my concern here, and that's why I'm speaking out. Normally, if I were at the newspaper, I wouldn't be involved in, uh, in these decisions, of course, but I felt it was important to speak out in this instance. Uh, the fact is, is that Jeff Bezos does have business interests. Of course, Amazon and then Blue Origin is space company. They have contracts with the government. Uh, I was proud that during my time at the Post and during uh, Jeff Bezos' ownership during that entire period, he resisted uh, pressure from Donald Trump. Trump tried to undermine the Am Amazon's business. He said he was going to do that. He threatened to increase postal rates, double them, triple them, quadruple them. Uh, he did intervene, intervene at a $10 billion Defense Department cloud computing contract to ensure that it did not go to Amazon. Uh, Bezos stood up to that. Uh, he let us do our work with full independence. He let the opinions department do their work as well. They actually wrote uh, two editorials against Trump's uh, campaign for the presidency, first in 2016 and then in 2020, uh, when uh, a question was raised as to whether they would actually write an editorial in 2016. Uh, Bezos said, well, why would we not issue a, a, an editorial endorsement? And they went ahead and did so. Uh, so I see this as... Uh, you know, a betrayal of the core principles of the post and and also a betrayal of the practices and the principles that Bezos himself professed dur uh, during my time at The Washington Post. I wrote about that in the book, how he stood up for us. I was very proud of that. I was very grateful for that. Uh, but this is something different. And all of this because Donald Trump managed to bully one of the wealthiest and most powerful men alive. At some point, you'd think he'd be rich enough to tell Trump to go kick rocks, but Evidently, he isn't. I mean, what's money for if you still have to bend the knee like this? But no bully ever gave in because you were nice enough to them and made sure not to say anything bad about them or even acknowledge the bullying. So if you ever want things to get better, then at some point you have to pick a spot to take a stand. And a week out from probably the most contentious, the most divisive, and the most important election of all of our lifetimes, that would be a really great spot to take that stand. Thanks for listening to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast. If you want to hear more, you can find us on the web at didnothingwrongpod.com. Please make sure you subscribe to get our content straight into your inbox. You can also follow us on Twitter at GrizzaBJJ, G-R-Z-A-B-J-J, as well as DNW Pod. We're extremely grateful for paid subscriptions and donations that allow us to keep doing this important work. Thanks, and remember, everyone mentioned did nothing wrong.